Hello, welcome. I see one person's here. That's awesome. Um, while people are maybe trickling in, I just want to start out by talking about some of the supplies that we're going to be using for this class. Um, so we are drawing a lovely barn owl. I posted the photo on my page. Um, so if you're able to have, you know, um, this photo pulled up on a second device or printed out, that would be awesome. So you can refer to it while I'm drawing. If not, that's okay too, because um, you can just follow along with what I'm doing. That'll work as well. So the basic supplies that I would recommend are, of course, um, just a regular, like, number two pencil. Or you might want to use a light HB drawing pencil of some kind. I really like the Derwent brand. But just a regular pencil is fine. The paper that I'm using is called Smooth Bristle Paper. It's Strathmore Bristle Paper. And I really like this brand because it's very smooth. So when you lay down the colored pencil on it, there's not going to be as many white spots or tooth showing through. Um, and then, if you have them, it's awesome to use colored pencils. But if you don't, you can always just use a regular pencil and follow along. And when I'm using lighter colors, you're going to want to use lighter pressure with your pencil. And when I use um, darker colors, you can just increase the pressure. You'll also want an eraser, an eraser that works well. That's important. Um, and a pencil sharpener. I like to keep my pencils very sharp for details. So those are the basic necessary supplies. Um, it, whatever kind of paper you're using is totally fine. I just wanted to give my recommendation. And then for colored pencils, you know, any kind of colored pencils are good to use. Um, as far as brands, Prismacolors are a really nice brand. That's what I've started out with. Um, they're very bold, bright colors. But I've, I've gradually came to the realization that my favorite brand, if I had to choose just one favorite, which is tough to do, are the Faber-Castell Polychromos pencils. Um, so I have a few colors laid out here ready to go. These are mostly polychromos, like these ones here. Um, I also really like Derwent pencils. So I have a few colors of Derwent that I'm going to use. Like, especially for the eyes on this owl, the Copper Beach is a really nice color to have. It's kind of this rich brown color. And in the Derwent pencils, I also really like this golden brown color. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here, Tan Po. Um, and then the other brand I really like are Luminance, um, Caran d'Ache Luminance pencils. This one I have in a pencil holder because it's almost gone. <laughs> That's another really awesome tool to use because when your pencil gets worn down until it's really small, then you can just stick it in there so that you use, you know, almost the entire pencil. Um, the other luminance that I really like is the black because it's really nice and dark. If you have areas that are very dark, this is a great pencil to have. But be aware if you're using this brand of pencil um, that it's almost like pastels. So when you put it down on the paper, it's going to be extremely hard to erase. Um, kind of a softer pencil. But what I really like about the, um, the Faber-Castell Polychromos is that they last a really long time and they hold a point really well. The Prismacolors are awesome pencils, but a frustrating thing about them is that they break really easily. So if you want to keep a very sharp point um, and you do a lot of drawing, it's good to use these because um, over time the Prismacolors will kind of get worn down a little bit faster. They're still really good pencils, though. It's good, to, it's good to have a variety of brands and try out what works best for you. All right. So if you have any questions throughout um, this workshop, feel free to type them into the chat box. But we're just going to get started with the outline of our owl. It's 
kind of nice. We don't have a, a lot of parts to deal with here. We're just basically doing a portrait. Um, oh, I also did want to mention that I got this photo from Pixabay. So Pixabay.com is a really good resource for artists because it has free reference photos. Um, so when you click on a photo, and if you see on the side that it says, um, no attribution required, free for commercial use, that means you can really use it for anything, and you don't have to attribute um, the photographer, which is really, really nice that those are available. Because if you do a Google image search and you want to use a reference photo, um, if, if it's just like a drawing that you're going to give to a family member or something, you know, that's okay as long as it's not for commercial purposes or anything like that. But if you're going to do a commission, you can't just take any photo that you find from Google image search. Because it's not fair to the photographer. Um, you know, that's... For a lot of people, that's how they make their living. You can't just take a photo and use it. Um, but this Pixabay one is totally free, so it's really nice. Um, so I'm just going to start out with the outline of the head. So to do that, I do like to measure using my pencil. How I do that is, you know, um, let's say I have... We're going to take another piece of paper here just to demonstrate. Let's say this is the owl's head. <laughs> That's what our owl is going to look like. No, I'm just kidding. So if you want to measure the width of this, what you can do is take the tip of your pencil here and then take like your thumb and, and forefinger here and go like that for the other edge. Now you have your measurement. We're certainly going to make um, a larger drawing than that, but just to demonstrate. But it is good practice to try and draw the shapes before you do that. Just so you can practice getting the proportions without having to measure every time. For the sake of time though, I'm going to measure beforehand. So I've got the width here. And when you're drawing the owl's face, um, just the round center of the face, you want to have it nice and big. Okay, so... A nice size, but also think about, okay, I want to have room for the neck and the shoulders as well. So think about that when you're positioning it. Alright, so you want to look at the width as well as the height. And I'm just measuring that facial disc, so that's like the heart-shaped part of the owl's face. Okay, and to get the shape down, you can also measure where there's that little indent at the top, okay? So that's going to be basically in the middle. I'll show you what I mean. And it's a good idea to draw this fairly lightly, so that if you need to erase or make adjustments, you can do so. It's almost kind of like the shape of an apple. You've got like this part that indents here at the top of the head, and then it gets flatter down here at the bottom. And I'm gonna draw it, you're looking at the screen, I'm gonna draw it a little bit darker than I normally would just to make sure that everyone can see. But definitely make very light lines with your pencil. Alrighty. can be good to double check your measurements too. And if you have a reference photo, pay close attention to the shape. Um, if you need to make small adjustments to the shape, like the width of, of the base here, you can. So a cool fact about owls, in case you don't know, the reason they have um, a facial disc like that is because it funnels um, the sound towards their ears. And many owls have asymmetrical ears. They have one ear up higher than the other, which helps them to triangulate sound, which means they can pinpoint the direction of, you know, like a rustling mouse in the leaves. 
All right, so now I've got that shape of the facial disc. I want to next get kind of the shape of the whole rest of the head. So that gray area on the top, just above here, can sketch in a line to show kind of that. So you can measure, you know, from this point up to the top. And try to look, if you have your reference photo out, at the shape of that curvature at the top of the head. And you can also see... So it curves down kind of sharply when you get to this point here, and the neck starts. the drawing is really important because if you don't have the the shape you know fairly accurate regardless of of the details once you get to that part it's it's not quite gonna look right if your shape is a little bit off so usually I I make kind of a lot of adjustments during this part of the drawing And then, if you have your photo, you'll notice, you know, there's like this beautiful orange color. The rough around the facial disc can sketch in the line to show sort of the border of that. Then, if you look at where the neck comes down and around, kind of goes like this. That's about right. Then you want to kind of look at the angle of that belly that comes around here. You can also pick a point to measure the width of the neck. So possibly where, um, where the wing starts. Be good to kind of go. Let's see if I can do this just to show you guys. Whoops. <laughs> so like across here you can measure the width of that neck. Hmm. Yeah. It's not quite right. It's got to be so it comes out here a ways. There we go. And then the angle here is actually kind of a strong angle around the belly where it comes around there. that that area that has all that gray patterning that's where the wing begins so we can sort of sketch that in and then the back comes out like this I also like to have a little brush like this, like a soft brush, just to get rid of some of those eraser crumbs, which can be really helpful once you start adding in um, pencil layers, because it'll avoid smudging things. Because if you just take your hand and go like this all the time, you can smudge things, which we do not want that. You do just have to be careful because if you have a lot of pencil dust on there from like maybe using a lot of pressure with your pencil and then you come in with this brush, it can create smudges. So just be very careful with that. Another thing that I'll do, but you do have to be careful with this, is if you have some of that dust like that, 
I'll actually pick up the paper and just shake it out <laughs> carefully a little bit. Alright, so we've got the basic shape in here. Oh, we can also show where the wing comes around here. Yeah, that's looking all right. So next, of course, we want to also um, put in the eyes and the bill. So for eyes, to get the placement correct, it's good to measure from the top of the head. What I usually do is measure from the top of the head down to like the corner of the eye at the front. Okay. I'll show you what I mean. So right like this. And then you'll also want to measure from the side of the head in. Oh, and it looks like I've gotten that about right. And then you want to measure the width and the length of the eye as well, okay? So when I say the corner of the eye, what I basically mean is like the tear duct. Can also see, okay, from the top of the head to the top of the eye. And down like that. So now I have this kind of square where I can, I can bring in that spherical shape now. But like I said, it's a good idea to try it out yourself. Just guesstimate and see how close you are. It's just good practice. Especially if you're interested in going out and doing field sketching. Because of course, if you're drawing a bird out in the field, you're not going to be able to do these measurements. So it's good to have some practice with ballparking. And it's also okay... Let's redo that. It's also okay to do some tracing when you're starting out just to help yourself learn. Um, a good thing to do is take like a clear piece of projector paper and an expo marker and if you have a printout of your reference photo you can trace it and then lay it over the top of your picture because that will show you where you need to make adjustments. So for um, the other eye, because of the angle of the face, this eye is going to look a little bit shorter. Another thing you can do to help yourself is very lightly, oh, I want to go down a little further. Put a line here, okay, to try and help you line things up. You can do the same thing to help you with the bell, lining that up. And it can be good to double check things like the width in between the eyes, for example. So to place the bill, we want to measure um, from the top of the head down to where it starts. And then from the top of the bill, that part that ex that's exposed, I'm talking about where it's not covered by feathers, from the top of the bill down to here. Hmm, and I notice I have a bit of a discrepancy. It looks like I might have, might need to recheck my measurements. Because that bill comes down almost to the end of the facial disc. Yeah, we got that coming down there. I 
Okay. Huh. Well, let's sketch it in. Well, the other thing is... Oh, we've got that shadow there, right. So that's about right. And then, of course, we also want to measure the width of the bill. So what you can do to figure that out is go from the edge of the facial disc in, and then you measure the width. Okay. And if any of that is, is confusing, please feel free to write in the comments um, any questions that you might have. So it's just like this little triangle shape. But then we also have all those feathers that come up over the top of the bill. So you can put in some lines um, just to show kind of where the edge of those that feather group is. Kind of like that. Okay. And we also have a little border of feathers around the facial disc. These are like really short, kind of stiffer feathers. So you can sketch that in too. And if you want to be really accurate, you can take a few measurements around different parts of it to try and gauge like the width of it. All right, that's looking pretty good. We can erase these guidelines if you put them in. Oh, and the other thing we can also do is outline where the pupils are. Which um, can be tricky to see sometimes because you have some shadows um, at the top of the eye. But you can just lightly sketch in basically the shape of the pupil right there. And you have to be careful when you're when you're drawing pupils on animals. It's a good idea to do a little research into like pupil shape. Because for example, if you're drawing a horse and you draw the pupil round like this, um, horse people are going to know that that isn't actually the shape of the pupil. So like the shape of um, a horse's pupil is actually... like that it's like this long oval that's also true of like goats okay so it's good if you're looking at a photo and anything is kind of hard to see because it's in shadow it's good to do a little bit of outside research and learn like a little more about your subject because sometimes there are things that you can show in a drawing or accentuate in a drawing that you're not going to be able to see as well in the reference photo. All right. So today what we're basically going to focus on is drawing the eyes. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Let's take a second here. I want to make sure that you guys can see it well. So for the eyes, um, if you're using colored pencils, the first thing we're going to want to do is get rid of most of that graphite because you don't want the graphite pencil to show through in your drawing. So you can erase the outline of your eye until you can barely see it. still want to be able to see it, but you don't want it to be to the point where it's going to show through on your drawing, okay? And this photo is really nice quality. It's nice we have some beautiful lighting on the eyes here. So I just want to show you some of the colors that I'm going to use for this. Um, so I'm going to take out some different shades of brown. 
copper beached or went is a really nice one or any kind of rich brown that you have so that could be like in prismacolors a dark umber would be good if you have prismacolor pencils any kind of medium sort of rich brown I might also be using some burnt umber uh, this is a polychromos probably some walnut brown that's a really good one to use for polychromos. It's one of my favorites. And then another really, really good one is dark sepia. It's like a very, very dark brown. Kind of like grayish brownish. And then for the highlights, I'm going to want to have a very light gray. I might mix a little bit of like warm gray and cool gray together. So I just want to let you guys know in case you're not aware, um, most colored pencil types, they have cold grays or cool grays and then they have warm grays. So the cold grays, it's going to be hard to see this, like just looking at the pencils, but the cold gray is more bluish, like cool, a cool color. The warm gray is more yellowish sort of hopefully you can see the difference there and also they're going to come in different intensities like different shades so this is cold gray one that's going to be the lightest and then warm gray one the lightest warm gray and in the polychromos they go numbered one to six in prismacolors if you have those they're in percentages so it's the same thing the higher the percentage, the darker the color is going to be, the more pigment you're going to have. But I'm going to use just some very, very light grays for those highlights. Because if you look closely at those highlights, you'll see that they're not like quite pure white. Although um, in this eye, there is a pretty bright highlight in there. Let's see, what else? Um, so this eye here, we have a little bit of warmer brown colors, just because of how the lighting is. The light is hitting, it's like coming from this direction, okay? So there's going to be a little bit more light on this eye. So it's good to have colors like burnt ochre, like these sort of orangish browns um, for that eye. And then another good pencil to use is dark indigo. So dark indigo mixed with a dark brown, like a dark sepia or walnut brown, will make black. And then usually what I do is I mix those together and then I go over the top of it with an actual black pencil. Like this one, if I want it to be really dark. Or I might use my um, polychromos pencil. So yeah, I use the luminance if it's like super jet black dark. But the trick is if you mix um, the brown and the blue together, or the, the dark indigo I mean, it will add some depth to the black. So if you use just black on its own, it's going to look kind of flat rather than three dimensional. Alright, so the first thing I like to do is just very lightly sketch in the outline of the eye with quite light pressure so that if I need to erase, I can. And I'm gonna use dark sepia to do that, but any sort of dark brown will work for that. Just make sure that your pencil is really sharp and that you use really light pressure in case you need to erase. Oh, another tool I wanted to mention is this electric eraser. This is a Sakura electric eraser it's really cool, it has these little erasers that you put in, and sorry if you've already heard this, but for anyone new I want to mention it. Um, for my Pine Warbler class, I know I used it a bit. It has these little erasers that you put in, and you can get packs of them for refills. But, um, if they get dirty ends, like you can see some of these have dirty ends, it's very important to replace it or flip it over, because you don't want to smudge your drawing. 
But it's nice, like, these packs are fairly inexpensive, so you can just replace them when they start to get dirty. But basically, it's battery-powered, and you press this little button here. And it works really well for a racing colored pencil. You just have to kind of get the hang of it and practice with it, because when you erase, um, sometimes you could erase more than you intended. And I like to use it for things like white whiskers. You just have to sort of get the feel of using the very edge of it. And if you want, you can take a scrap piece of paper and lay down some color and just practice. Like pretend you're erasing whiskers into it, you know. Alright, so let's get started. Um, for my base... Oh, I didn't do the outline yet. We're going to do the outline and then we're going to do a base layer. So look carefully at the shape of the eye in your photo if you have it out. You'll see that it has like an arch shape at the top here. But it comes to a point like right here and then right down here. Owls of course have really really big eyes. Um, so they have amazing night vision. And their eyes are actually fixed in their skull, so they can't, like, move their eyeballs around to look from side to side. So to compensate for that fact, they're able to turn their head around 275 degrees. <laughs> Pretty cool. There are so many amazing facts about owls. Um, if I start talking about that... <laughs> I'm going to get too sidetracked, but yeah, they have amazing vision. So you have that round shape on the top, and then you also have a round shape coming around here. So it's very spherical. And then, you know, the actual eyeball is just like this shape here, okay? So it's good to do that just to plot out the outline and know like where you're going to be shading and drawing. Um, so for my base layer, I'm going to use, actually I'm going to use nougat, um, but any, any kind of neutral brown color is good to use and I'm going to use very light pressure when I'm putting this in and I'm going to go around the pupil and just shade in that whole area with this neutral sort of light brown color and of course parts of this are much darker than what I'm shading in but it's always good um or I should say it's usually good with colored pencils if you're using um, white drawing paper like this to go from light to dark when you're layering them. So you look at, at the area and you say, what's the lightest color that I see? And then you build up layers over the top of that. Okay, so next I'm going to bring in a slightly darker, or quite a bit darker actually, brown. I'm going to use the walnut brown, and I'm going to start putting in some shadows. I'm going to make sure it's pretty sharp. And if you really want to practice eyes, um... The good thing to do, too, is just do an eye study where you draw a really big eye on a piece of paper. Sorry if the focus is funny when I do that. <laughs> I don't want to make you dizzy. But yeah, that way you can really pay attention to the details. But I'm just going at the top part of the eye here and shading in some of the shadows. And this isn't the darkest color we're going to use. We're going to go darker than this. But we're just starting to like gradually build up layers. And 
Because the thing is, too, the more layers you have, the less you're going to have to worry about white paper showing through. And it's like the combination of those layers and different colors working together is what's going to add depth to the drawing. So think of, of course, the eyeball as, as being round. Think about that when you're shading it. And think about where you see highlights. So I see a highlight at the top of the pupil. We're not really worrying about that one yet. But I also see this area here. So if you see an area that's lighter, do try to isolate that and make sure you don't put pencil down there. Because having contrast in different parts of the eye is what's going to make it look really alive. Um, I would say if you had to pick the most important part of an animal drawing, the eyes are it. Because that's like the risk of sounding cheesy. That's like the soul of the animal. So you want it to, to really look alive. So I use darker pressure or harder pressure when I'm in areas like the top of the eye and any other areas that look really dark. So like this corner here. Can also sort of define the outline here a little bit more. But you know, if you accidentally do go into an area that you wanted to keep lighter, you can always come back in with an eraser. And that's where something like an electric eraser is really nice to have. And if you want to smooth out transitions between colors, you can come in with a lighter color and that will, that will help smooth the transition there. Blend it a bit. I'm also going to add a little copper beach. It's got a nice brightness to it. And we're also, we're going to up the contrast by bringing in some really dark colors. So like dark sepia. So next, using, using a sharp pencil, dark sepia. I'm going to start adding some of the very dark areas. But be careful when you do this when you're using hard pressure because once you start using really hard pressure it's going to be difficult to erase. Especially if you don't have um, an electric eraser. And I'm going to mix this with dark indigo. So I'm not going to use like the hardest possible pressure, but it's just going to be a little bit more pressure. And then dark indigo. And just keep thinking about the shape of that eye and maintaining the shape. And one thing when you're doing colored pencil, um, don't get discouraged if you're putting down layers and you say, oh, it doesn't look like the picture because it takes time um, Bonnie Snowden, whose tutorials I really like, she calls it like the ugly stage. So when you have like the first couple layers down, it's like, oh man, that doesn't really look like the picture. But don't get discouraged because colored pencil is all about adding more and more layers and it'll gradually start to look more realistic. So I'm going to start on the pupil now too, um, probably going to add, you know, some, some more layering and blending, but just to get the pupil in there and started. Um, 
So it's good to, to take a look at your photo if you have it out and outline the highlights, basically. Because the highlights, it's really important that we try not to get color down in the highlights. So you can take like a dark sepia to outline. And another tip when you're drawing something from a photograph, um, if you see like two really bright highlights that are separated from each other, that is not a natural thing. That is because of the flash. Um, so try to sort of connect them, it's the flash from the camera. Um, I don't see that going on here, but sometimes that can happen in photos, so you want to be careful and aware of that. And it's cool sometimes, you know, if you're drawing eyes that are pretty big, you can even see sort of the landscape in the eye, which I'm trying, I'm trying to look at that. I think I can see some clouds in there. But yeah, we're just getting the basic outline there. Maybe some trees in here. <laughs> And sometimes when I'm drawing eyes, I'll try to even, like, show that in the highlight. Or even I might, I might kind of make it up. Like, I was doing this illustration um, for a children's book, which is, it's kind of on pause now. But <laughs> I put, like, a heart shape for the highlight in the goose's eye. It's a very subtle thing, but just kind of cool. You can kind of make up those those shapes. It doesn't have to be exactly what you see. But now what I'm doing is going around that highlight with the dark sepia and I'm using very light pressure and just shading in the whole pupil. But don't use really dark pressure because we're going to mix this with dark indigo. And we want both colors to kind of show through. Then we're going to take the dark indigo over the top. I hope it's focusing properly, is it? Yeah, looks like it. And use similarly kind of medium pressure to mix those together. Now we can start adding black. I'm going to use the polychromos black and go over the top of this now. So I'm using pretty pretty dark pressure now. Being very careful to stay out of the highlighting area. Okay, and I think, let me just change the angle of this a little. We might be getting a little reflection going on. Yeah, it's because that's a bit better, I think. Um, when you use really dark pressure with colored pencils, especially black, sometimes it can get a little shiny when the light's hitting it. And now, I'm going to take Van Dyke Brown, which is pretty similar to um, 
is a nougat. It's like a little bit of a richer color though than nougat. And I'm going to use that to start blending um, some of the browns in here a little bit more. As you can see, I spend a lot of time on eyes because first of all, they're fun. And second, they're like a really important part of the drawing. I always like to start with eyes because I consider them to be so important. And I, I like to start with, with that first when I'm shading, you know, like when I'm freshly ready to draw basically is what I'm saying. And then you can see there's kind of like a bright spot right here. Good to put in something like a copper beach, which is pretty bright. Right in there. To erase a little bit here. There's definitely been times with an eye like of this size where I've spent like an hour or even more on an eye if it's really big. <laughs> and you could spend even more than that, you know, but you got, there is a point where you have to say, okay, if I keep going any further, I might mess it up, which is <laughs> also a thing that can happen. So looking at this, I've realized I want to make the pupil a little bit bigger. So I'm going to expand pupil. Actually using, you know, the same process of layers as I had before. So dark sepia first. Dark indigo. Finally black. So for that highlight, um, the highlight is not completely white, right? So I'm going to add in a little bit of gray to that. And also maybe just a hint of blue. Oh, let me get my sky blue pencil. So a tiny bit of blue, like the sky blue, can be nice to add to highlights, but using pretty light pressure. We're going to have a little cold gray one in here mixed with that sky blue. But I'm only going to put it in part of the highlight. So, yeah, like the left side... Because it's good to leave a little bit of it really, really bright white to have that contrast. Because it will help the eye to look more alive. If you have part of it really white. And another thing that you can do for blending this area is take a white pencil to help you blend. Once you do that though, you might realize that some of um, some of the brightness of your colors is lost. So you may have to go over the top of it again with another layer. But that white really helps to smooth it out. And you may say, oh, I lost some of the, the light highlight contrast. You can take an eraser and just go. Of course, once you do that, you got like this hard outline, so you have to go back and smooth that out. But similarly to the highlight that you have here, it's nice to have 
part of this be very, very light. It will help the eye to look alive. So as you can see, I do a lot of erasing and readjusting. It's all part of the process. And it's good to try not to be afraid of having a lot of contrast, of having the dark parts be really, really dark. It's going to be hard to do sometimes, but contrast is what helps it to look realistic. And yeah, I would recommend for dark areas to, to do it very gradually. And it's always nice um, to add um, sort of a really brighter kind of brown in there, but just a hint of it. Sometimes I'll even use orange, but this particular eye not really orangey so I'm not gonna do that I'm just gonna use a little bit of this is burnt ochre hopefully that's showing up let's take a look yeah so the other eye is similar um but it's it's a little bit different because like i said you know the light is coming in this way so you're gonna have more of orangey tones in here so i just wanted to talk a little bit about that difference so again to start this one i'm gonna erase the graphite till you can barely see it And for this one, for the base layer, I'm actually going to use a different color. So I'm going to use this burnt ochre and very light pressure. First, we'll do our outline in dark sepia again. And the shape of this eye is also a little bit different because if you look at the angle of the head, this is kind of like facing slightly more away from us. So let me do this. You have a pretty strong curve here at the top. And you know this shadow here, by the way, the shadow that's like in this area is caused by the eyelid coming up over. Then you have that kind of little um, I'm actually not sure if it would be called a tear duct, but in our eye it would be called a tear duct, right here. And then you have this part that curves down and around. Oops. Nice a little bit here. And again it comes sort of to that little point right there, okay? And then the pupil right here. Oh, but when we outline this pupil, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to end kind of right here because we have a highlight that's coming up and around. And it may help actually to just start to outline that highlight. I'm going to switch over to, to the burnt ochre this part and 
All right, now I'm just gonna put a base layer down like I did before using pretty light pressure. So if you don't have burnt ochre, you know, another color that could work is something like terracotta. Which is this color here. It's a little bit more intense though, so just be careful. Don't use quite as, as much pressure. But any kind of orangish brown will do. By the way, I should mention um, another thing. You know, when I'm drawing, it's best, uh, I'm kind of breaking a rule here, it's best not to put your hand directly down onto the paper because oils from your hand can get onto the paper. Um, so I like to sometimes take another piece of paper, put it under my hand so that doesn't happen. But, you know, if you recently wash your hands and then your hands are dry, it's not going to be as big of a deal. So there's the base layer. And if you're looking at your photo, you'll see, of course, that you have this darker area in here. And then it gets much lighter as you go down. You even have this kind of a line right here. It's kind of like the internal structure of the eye where it's darker and then it's lighter underneath of that. It's interesting. Um, so I'm going to start adding in some shadows. Again, I'm going to use the walnut brown for that to start with. Put in a little bit of, of dark sepia in some of those darker areas. This edge here is a pretty dark line. We're going to go over this with black too. And then, you know, I'm not getting around to this part yet, but there is going to be outside of this, there's going to be this little edge to the eye where you have a darker line with a little highlight in the middle and we'll, we'll talk about that later. But, okay. You can start to, to put some of this darker area in but I'm using very very light pressure here. A little bit of dark indigo here, too. So yeah, it's just, it's something about how these colors interact. The dark indigo with the brown. If you keep on layering that, it's just going to make things look a lot more 3D than the black this plain black on its own. And now copper beach is a really nice color to use here for some of the richer um, tones of brown that you have. I'll bring that in here. Their wet pencils have certain colors that just don't really come in other brands. So I really like them for that. Um, Especially like shades of brown. This is the walnut brown again. So again, I'm trying to get 
some contrast in here just so that this highlight in the bottom area really stands out. And that will usually happen with eyes where you have this highlight, sort of like re this reflected light here on the bottom part of the eye, which will help to make it look round if you make sure to maintain that. All right, let's also put in some color for the pupil. So dark sepia and the dark indigo. Again, using pretty light pressure for both of them and mixing them together. It always looks kind of funny without the pupil shaded in, so I like to not get too far along with the eye without, without doing that part. And then we can go over the top of it with the black. And some colored pencil artists actually don't even use black at all. Um, I like to have it as kind of the last thing that you put in, but it's kind of personal preference. If you do use a lot of layers of brown and blue and uh, dark indigo, it eventually will really just look like black. It's pretty neat. Um, so... For this highlight, oh, we do need a little bit more shadows here in the top of the eye, too, don't we? Let's put those in. And I will say this is a little bit quicker than I would normally spend time on these eyes. The more you look at eyes like this, the more details and things you'll notice and the more things you might want to adjust. But if I spend like two hours on eyes, it might put you guys to sleep. So <laughs> This is just the basics of drawing eyes. And sometimes highlights have a lot of different shapes in them and things. So like, for example, I could go to this highlight and say, oh, I want to get my pencil super sharp and like add in some more little details to the shadow. And I like to do a lot of visualizing. So think about like this is an orb that you're drawing here. So cold gray one and a tiny bit of sky blue. I'm going to put like some sky blue in here. And the blue just with light pressure livens up the highlight a bit more. show you guys a little bit of um, putting in the feathers around the eyes too. Uh, oh, of course I'm going to notice. I'm going to do a little bit more blending here. Let's see. Yeah, I'll probably make more adjustments to these eyes later, but that's the basics. <laughs> Okay. So, oh, before we move on to the feathers around, I just want to show you, I'm not using cadmium orange in this particular 
on this particular bird. But cadmium orange is a really nice color to use in eyes sometimes. If you have a lot of orange tones going on in, um, in this highlight part that's at the bottom of the eye. Um, you can put just lightly a little bit of that in there. But, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to put it in this one. Because this guy is kind of like chocolate brown colored eyes. But an animal with kind of lighter eyes, I might do that. Alright, so... For these feathers that are going to be around here... Might actually use some of that cadmium orange because they're actually pretty bright. But things like cadmium orange and also the burnt ochre and terracotta are going to be some colors that you want. So like really orangey colored browns. Barn owls have a lot of these really pretty oranges in their feathers. Pretty neat. Um... So again, when you're putting these feathers in, just like with the eyes, it's good to look at what's the lightest thing first, and then you build up those layers gradually. So I'm just, just going to do a small section of this, just to show you guys. So if you want to work on it in your own time. And then, next week, we'll continue and show you some more techniques for various areas and stuff. But I'm going to start, just because it's kind of an easier and basic area, I'm going to start with this part below the eye. Oh, and before we get to that, I, I also want to show you this little area underneath the eye, how we're going to do that. So if you look very closely at your reference photo, you'll see... You get a very, very sharp pencil. I'm using this Van Dyke Brown. You can put this sort of lower lip here. And it's a very thin area that you're just going to put in like that. And it's really shiny. I actually have... So that's like skin, but you have some little dots very subtle thing. I may have to zoom in to show you exactly what I mean, but you should be able to see it on your reference photo. Oh yeah, that should show up there. And then it's a little bit darker when you get towards this area. You also have it above the eye too. But since that's darker, I would use something like dark sepia to do that part. Okay. So... These are interesting feathers. They're quite a challenge, actually, but it's a lot of fun. I just want to show you the basic structure of, like, what these feathers look like. So, let me show you on a scrap piece of paper. Basically, these are really fluffy feathers. And if you zoom in on your reference photo, you'll see you have this heart shape. Right? And then, the eyes, and you have feathers coming out in rays. So, the central shaft of the feather comes out like this, and then you have the barbs coming off like that. And then it overlaps with the next feather that's beside it, just like this. Alright. Um, so it's, it's subtle and kind of hard to see if you look at the photo, but you should be able to see that middle part of each feather. Um, and while the, while the feathers are white when you come out towards the edge of the, of the face, 
It's not really white, of course, because if you look at that texture, you can see gray in between the feather barbs. So bird feathers are really neat in that, you know, they have the middle part, that's the shaft of the feather, then barbs coming around like this. And if you were to take a microscope in between the barbs, or I should say coming off of the barbs, you have these little tiny hooks called barbules. So if you watch a bird preening, um, reorganizing its feathers and preening, what it's doing is zipping those barbules together like a zipper. You might see the bird take its beak and like go zip across there um, to reorganize the feather. And if you pick up a feather, you know, you can zip the barbs together too. It's pretty neat. All right, so what I'm going to do is just sketch in a few of those feathers, just like a couple of them. And I'm this is really just for a guide. So I'm using a very light color. This is cold gray one. And this isn't what the final result is going to look like, but I just want to give myself a guide and draw very lightly because you are going to end up erasing but you have this middle part of the feather here. I do want to make sure people can see. So if you can't see, please write in the comments that you can't see. <laughs> but then you have these barbs coming off here. But you'll notice, of course, at the base, of these feathers that you have orange, orange is brownish going on here. So you can take like a light cadmium orange and you always want to go in the direction of the barbs. Zoom in. No, no. Right. And you can mix that together with a little bit of the burnt ochre. In the darker areas, sort of in between the barbs. And you want your pencils to be pretty sharp for this too. Then you can use a slightly darker, like a cold gray 3, as you come down here in between these barbs. But, it's also a good idea to put in, block in some of these dark areas. So I just want to show you how to do, for example, a feather that's right here. You can take your dark sepia and put in, or, or any dark brown that you may have, and start adding some textury shadows in here. Well, it's partly shadows and it's partly the actual pigment of the feathers. And try to really look at the direction of the barbs as you go. Follow that texture. Because the nice thing about colored pencils is when you get them really sharp, they're so awesome for, for textured things like feathers and fur. If you're someone who loves details like me, colored pencils are a lot of fun. <laughs> So we have this dark area here. We also have some feathers. So look at the direction the feathers are coming out. They're all kind of coming out in rays. Almost like flower petals coming around the middle of a flower.
So then we have, I'm using the burnt ochre again. These orangey brown tones. Let's say I have a feather coming out here. And as you get further out, it's going to become gray. Very light gray. This coal gray one. So these are pretty fluffy feathers here. And for some of the brighter areas, you can bring in cadmium orange as well, or any kind of bright orange. Okay, and then when you get to the edge of the facial disc, I'm going to erase some of this graphite here. Have the fringes of the feathers coming out here. And then we have pretty well-defined shadows with a quite dark gray. Let's zoom in on that a bit. So you can use like a cold gray six and have these little textury parts at the end of the feathers. And keep looking at where their where their shadows you can take again like the cold gray three and go in between some of these barbs higher up here. And I'll admit, this is the first time I've drawn a barn owl portrait, but this is both fun and challenging. There's a lot going on with these feathers. So there are some places where there's kind of more pigment, like closer to the eye, where you can use a little bit more pressure with your burnt ochre. You might even want to use the terracotta. This one here, I'm going to sharpen it. Because that's really bold. And then you can take like a burnt umber, a darker brown and go in between some of those barbs to have some of the darker areas in there, the shadows. Barn owls are just so pretty. They have so many colors going on in their plumage. And these owls are actually, sadly, in, in quite a bit of trouble. Um, in the U.S. especially, rodenticides are a big issue for them, and habitat loss. So 
So please, please do not use rat poisons. Don't use rodenticides, things like decon. Sadly, you, you can a lot of times get those things in the grocery store, which really should not be legal. Um, because the raptors, the birds of prey that that eat rodents can die from eating poison rats and poison rodents. And so can dogs and cats. Sadly, I mean, cats shouldn't be outside anyway, but... Yeah, rodenticides are a big issue. So I'm using the burnt umber in some of these dark areas just to make it a little more of like a rich brown in there. And some texture up here too. Yeah, so keep thinking about where do I see contrast? Because as you bring in more layers and more contrast, um, colors will start to really pop and things like that. Contrast is important. It just take some patience. <laughs> start that we have going on here um, so if you in the meantime want to work on some of these feathers around in this area next week we'll talk about the feathers up further on the face and also how to draw um, some of the feathers around the edge of the facial disc as well and we might have time to get started on the bill too we'll see but yeah, I would recommend just gradually um, adding in the barbs here to some of these feathers in this general area here. Up in here too. Okay. Um, and then in future classes, of course, we'll talk about drawing the back feathers and the neck feathers here, which have a lot of cool patterns going on. All right. So if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat box. That would be awesome. But otherwise, I'm planning to do another one of these classes, part two, um, next Saturday at the same time at 8 p.m. Hope you guys can join. And also, if you have any questions that you think of later on, feel free to send me a message or comment on this video and I'll see that. Um, you can also send me, via Messenger, you can send me a photo of your sketch. I would love to see that. And, and if you'd like any tips, feel, feel free to send me a photo. This has been a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or the rest of your evening, wherever you are in this world. And have a great day. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone.